ago. I just celebrated my 40th, you know, anniversary from graduating from Duke. <laughs> I said, God, 40 years. <laughs> and it has taken 40 years to really get to this point. So theta has always been a sleep wave. And um, the same thing with the slowest delta wave activity, that's specifically sleep. And we don't associate theta and delta with the waking state. Now what the mind mirror shows us and what we've realized as we've gotten into the digital age is that all four frequencies are always available and are always in play in both wakefulness and sleep. But you have different amplitudes and, um, you know, there is a predominant beta and a predominant perhaps alpha, but you don't tend to see the slower waves as much. So what has fascinated me about the mind mirror is you're bringing in those slower wave forms and actually reinforcing them to be more prominent in the waking state. So you're bringing, you know, what we would traditionally call the sleep state or unconsciousness, you're bringing that more into the waking state. So that to me was a real major breakthrough and something that we don't talk about in, in, in mainstream, you know, sleep work or in EEG. In fact, if you see delta activity down here is the delta, and this is what it looks like when you're recording it at 10 millimeters per second, 30 seconds worth of it, you can see these are very high amplitude waves. We're talking about anything from, you know, 75, it had to be at least 75 microvolts to be counted up to 200 and 50 or even higher. In the waking state, when you see this kind of activity, and even, you know, at 500 microvolts, you are talking about seizure activity. This is abnormal to see this in the waking state. So that's why I was always curious what it looked like with the mind mirror. What are these waves, underlying waves, what do they look like? And how do they appear in the otherwise background faster activity of beta and alpha? Right after birth, down at the bottom, we have age. Uh, right after, and we have minutes along the uh, y-axis. You'll notice that right after birth is when your REM sleep or active sleep is maximal. And you'll see that your delta sleep is maximal for the first 10 to 12 years of life. And then delta sleep starts to fall off. And notice on this bottom line, and I know a lot of us are, you know, middle-aged and going into our senior years. I know I am. And you'll notice that there's very little delta sleep. So that's another thing about the mind mirror and building that delta sleep waveform, reinforcing it and building it back up. Um, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, you know, experienced meditators using the mind mirror have more delta sleep um, you know, even in their later years, and sleep better and sleep deeper, um, because they're literally practicing. And I now think of the brain as sort of a muscle, a regenerating muscle. If you 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 exercise it um, through some biofeedback technique, particularly in terms of different frequencies, brain frequencies, you build it back up. Now we 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 now know that you know in. in when I was going through school, I mean, all our textbooks said that, you know, neurons couldn't regenerate. Well, we know that's, that's bogus. Yeah, they regenerate like every other cell in the body, right? Why should we think it would be different? But we did. And not only that, but we create new networks. We create and reinforce new networks as well as by not using certain networks, they will go into, um, you know, a, a more apathetic state. They, they, they simply um, uh, atrophy over time if we do not exercise uh, those networks. So, that's one thing I think is going on with the mind mirror. Certainly, if we looked at sleep, we probably would see deeper, more consolidated sleep. Could awakened mind meditation training work on delta so that it could increase sleep? And that is absolutely true. Um, one way 
it increases is that when you start to develop this awakened mind, you become more empathetic and you increase your connection to other people and you increase your connection to the spirit. So you're increasing your amplitude of your delta waves. And I sleep like a baby and just about other than people who are doing awakened mind training and are developing these gamma waves, which do seem to interrupt sleep for them. Um, I, most meditators do sleep, sleep better. And there's even a tiny aspect of that that's worth mentioning, um, considering your hypothesis, which I think is better than a hypothesis. And it's that um, the more you meditate and the more you increase your connection with, let's call it this, sea or field or ocean of quantum light, which some would call God, plug-in source, um, what starts to happen is that um, instead of your delta splaying outward like this in a searching, reaching outward kind of connection with the field, your delta starts to turn in or curve upward in that bottom of that evolved mind pattern and so that there's an upflow or an inflow of energy from the field into your personal subconscious mind. And so you're plugging in to that field potentially all the time, whether you're in or out of meditation. <clears throat> and so, so you, you're more relaxed, you're more restored. There's a um, age attenuating uh, aspect to meditation. And um, and you, I think, sleep better as well. So now we go to the mind mirror and where this all intersects. And I think where you start is the fact that we really are dealing with three brains here. And we're dealing with a down-up system yet. So that first brain is really, you know, it's a reptilian brain, okay? Um, it is the brain stem and the pons, and it's responsible for most of our autonomic nervous system functioning, all right? So it keeps us breathing, keeps the heart going, it communicates constantly with the heart. Sleep is a biological need, just like hunger and thirst. And so now we go up to the midbrain, which is emotions and the limbic system, um, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and then we go up to the highest brain, the neocortex, which is relatively new from an evolutionary standpoint. So everything is, everything coming in from the body, all the information, and particularly from the heart, has to travel through this emotional brain. And if that emotional brain is very labile, volatile, and so on, as it gets up to the neocortex and to the frontal lobes, which, you know, regulate our decision-making capabilities, we can't think straight. So you need to balance both the bottom and the midbrain in order to maximize the functioning of that top brain. And that's what heart math is trying to do. Um, by regulating the autonomic nervous system, particularly the heart and breathing, um, we control our emotions, we balance it, so that coming up through the middle of the brain, you don't trigger a panic response, you don't trigger a flight or fight response. And when our emotions are balanced, we think straight. So that allows the neocortex to operate at a more optimal level. What I think meditation, and certainly what Maxwell Cade and, and what Anna Weiss were operating and trying to do, and Joe Camilla, obviously, is get the brain to operate in a top-down fashion and get better control of the neocortex over the bottom two brains. What I've gleaned from the mind mirror and my work in sleep is that all of our efforts now using brain waves as a mechanism for biofeedback are geared towards strengthening and empowering the neocortex over the lower two brains, getting that kind of connectivity to go in a top-down way.